Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us. <clears throat> for the last two years, the number of police officers serving the city of Burlington has been a matter of major discussion and concern. Since early 2020, we've seen the number of officers drop from basically the mid-90s, where it had generally been for many years, to our current number of 61 officers, uh, with 53 of those officers being available for deployment. And that's what this first chart shows here. Um, in this period of declining officers, we have also seen some very concerning public safety trends. After years of nearly all crime metrics moving in the right direction, um, this table summarizes some of the public safety challenges that we're currently facing, if you can advance to the next slide. So these are comparing 2022 year to date, according to BPD statistics versus the five year average. Public safety is a core responsibility of local government and turning these trends around, especially gun violence, is my highest priority right now and a focus of much of my time day in and day out these in, right now. In past press conferences over recent months, we have talked about major investments the city is making to address these issues by creating um, additional public safety resources, including adding social workers to the BPD team, adding urban park rangers to the park staff, and creating other CSO positions, uh, non-armed public safety personnel and, and more. However, to fully address our current public safety challenges and ensure that this community continues to be one of the safest cities in the country, we need to rebuild the department to the authorized headcount as soon as possible. Today's press conference is focused on communicating to the community, to our current officers and to prospective officers, how we intend to do that and to get back to a department with 85 sworn officers over the next three years. And the next slide here shows what, you know, uh, uh, what that could look like. There's a lot of, of course it won't work out exactly like that, but that trend of um, getting back to 85 officers uh, three years from now is what this rebuilding plan is focused on. Um, uh, again, I'm a, we're gonna, we've talked about this some in the past. People who have been following this discussion very closely will note that I think most of what we are communicating um, was part of our discussions with the city council over the last couple of months, but wanted to kind of pull this all together in one place and communicate it to everyone so everyone understands what we're attempting to do. I particularly, uh, I see a few of our current and new officers here with us today. I particularly want to be communicating this to current Burlington police officers who are um, right now working too hard. We're asking too much from them. There was too much overtime, uh, too much pressure on the remaining number of officers after the declines we've seen in the last three years. Um, uh, one bright spot in um, our current efforts is that we did just uh, in the last couple of weeks hire three new officers that are headed to the academy in August and the three of them are with us at the back of the room today and we uh, we're grateful for your service and looking forward to I'm looking forward to working with you uh, over the years ahead and um, want to point out uh, that the uh, uh, this, a lot of this success is a result of um, at the back of the room. Also, we have our recruitment officer, uh, Maggie, who's been focused on this uh, as a key part of her. Um, Meg is a key part of this for um, the last year plus. Um, so the next slide here shows, Dan, if we could advance, um, the basic three-part strategy that we have been talking about for um, securing that trajectory that we just showed. It involved uh, retaining officers at a better rate than we have in the past through um, a uh, new contract. It involved recruiting new officers through both the contract and additional incentives uh, that we are now offering. Um, and uh, marketing and communicating the um, the, uh, what is unique about Burlington, what the opportunities are here, um, is something that we are now um, uh, doing to a greater degree than we ever have in this past, than we ever have in the past. The 
um, as we do this work, one, one of our goals, in addition to getting back up to the, the, into the mid-80s for the number of officers, is to rebuild a department that fully reflects the Burlington community with a, a focus on um, hiring women, uh, something that has been a goal and something that the BPD has successfully achieved better than much of the industry at times. Um, in recent years, it's a goal during this rebuilding period. We're also looking to hire as many BIPOC officers as we can, including specific efforts aimed at hiring from our uh, Burlington immigrant communities. The next slide, uh, um, I think this gets into some of the detail. Actually, the chief is going to go through in a minute. I just I wanted to f finish with the uh, just the resources that we're dedicating to this. Um, we have secured two big council working with the city council, and I'm appreciative of the council's partnership. Um, in recent months, uh, we have really significant resources to pursue this new plan. There is um, approximately $1.2 million in our, the rebuilding plan that was approved in the budget in June. It's a three-year uh, budget, essentially, to um, uh, fund this effort. It includes $750,000 of uh, funds from the last year's budget that um, we did not spend, uh, in part because of, you know, in large part because of the significant reduction in the number of officers. These funds are now being redeployed into this rebuilding plan. Um, in addition, we are, there was $220,000 of unspent recruitment incentives from a, a prior um, recruitment and retention initiative last fall. That money is being redeployed to this effort. And we are expecting to work over three years with the, city, the Queen City Police Foundation um, uh, to an unprecedented degree to bring in um, funds that uh, will help offer specific in incentives to, uh, to officers. The, um, and again, I just, I uh, thank the city council for their partnership in, in supporting that budget. Also, the other thing the council did is, is uh, that we have been talking in recent weeks is approve a new contract. This new contract um, is a contract that will allow the, the Chief Murad and the BPT to be very competitive as we attempt to retain officers and recruit new officers, given the 12% increase in, in salary that is approved as part of that contract in the first year um, and, and the, the follow-on years of uh, additional uh, increases. Um, with that, uh, I now am going to turn over the podium to Chief Murad, who will walk us through the details of how these funds are going to be used and um, the details of how we're going to accomplish this plan. Thanks, Thank Chief. you, sir. Um, sorry. There I go. <laughs> uh, thanks, and, and welcome. Uh, I actually uh, I have been told before that I uh, need to be a little bit less uh, grim when I stand at this podium, but most of the time it's because we are at this podium for reasons that are not good ones. We are here to debrief about crime or about some incident, uh, and this is not that. This is a great moment. I'm really, really happy to be at this podium to talk about where we are right now. This uh, contract that was uh, gotten with the mayor, uh, that was approved by the city council, the budget that the mayor worked so hard to get along with uh, uh, CAO Catherine Shad, along with uh, the approval of the City Council, great work with uh, City Council President Karen Paul to uh, achieve a unanimous approval of that budget. These are real turning points for us, and they, they represent a moment for us to be able to begin to rebuild and regrow. And to, to basically say, all right, uh, the, you, you saw that prognostication, that, that uh, graphic that showed headcount. Um, today's headcount, the, the headcount there is August 1st. And yet, we're already up. We're up by three people and are, are moving in that direction. I am hopeful that what we see in that graph represents uh, a nadir, a bottom for us. Uh, it may not. We may lose a couple more people over the rest of this calendar year. I actually do believe that we will. But I also believe that we can begin bringing people in. And I am speaking directly to uh, people in Chittenden County, in the state of Vermont, who want to be police officers. If they want to be police officers here, we want them to come. We are looking for good men and women to join this most important of professions. 
And so uh, I think that what we have here is one of the most competitive packages in the state. I think it's a, a very competitive package for the region. I'm already hearing from people who aren't from Vermont interest in coming to this place. The profession as a whole is in a tough spot. The profession as a whole has lost people. The profession as a whole has struggled with recruitment and retention. Uh, and to a certain extent, we are looking for people who are, are either leaving other places or could go to other places. And what brings them here? Well, this is a big part of it. The other big part of it is the support that this demonstrates. This demonstrates a new, uh, a new era for the, the working with the city council, working with the administration, working with the police commission, working with the city that we serve in order to say we have recognized that where we are right now with regard to public safety isn't where we want to be. But we do want to move forward into something better. And I think this gives us those tools, and I'm really eager for it. Um, I, I think that there are you know, some specifics that we can talk about with regard to some of the ways that we do that. And we've talked about this a bit at the Board of Finance, uh, and uh, when uh, getting the budget approved, they, excuse me, they include new positions to help us reach those people out there who want to be police officers, both people who are already police officers and we hope to attract to this unique and terrific community, and people who aren't police officers yet who have thought about it, who bring with them skill sets that we've always needed in law enforcement and new skill sets that we recognize we want now. And we're doing that in a lot of ways, not just with police officers, because when it comes down to it, these, it is not just about police officers. We have community support uh, liaisons that we are hiring. We have three new positions to hire for, their, uh, for that. We have uh, a total of six to seven uh, community service officers. Uh, one of our new recruits was a community service officer who's making that transition into the police world. We're hopeful to see that happen more. We're hopeful to bring excellent candidates in in those roles. Um, we've had a lot of challenges over the past two years. Uh, and, and in all of these challenges, I, I believe, I hope, there has been a consistent theme. Our shared mission is keeping people safe. But on, on a day-to-day -day basis, it is police officers who do that work, augmented now by CSOs and CSLs. Our job as a city is to support these men and women as they do that work and to set clear expectations on how. And the two clearest examples of support that they need are this budget that the mayor has put together and the, both the AFSME contract and the BPOA contract that have been approved by our city council. The expectations have to be clear too. We have to treat everyone fairly, we have to treat everyone compassionately, and we have to do that competently. Um, I, I often use the word neighbors rather than citizens or civilians because as Sir Robert Peel said, the police are the public and the public are the police. Cops and the community have to be one and the same. And I've spoken again and again internally with the officers about our living up to the words on paper that our country has established. What America says on paper is that it's what the Declaration of Independence promised, that all people are created equal and endowed with unalienable rights like life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. What America says on paper is that our Constitution promises that we establish justice and that we ensure domestic tranquility and promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty. Putting these words on paper is not the end. It's just a beginning. All of those things require public safety. All of those things require a, a safe public in which all of us can share our public spaces together equally fairly. And a big step to that is this, and bringing people aboard. So uh, we do hope to hire a new public uh, information officer and community engagement coordinator. That's a single position with a very long title, but it's a position that is going to help us tell our story about what we're doing to share that story, sometimes with you, the media, uh, with regard to specific events, so that it's not just my phone that you're texting at, you know, f at four on a Sunday afternoon, uh, but it is also uh, a person who's engaged with the media in that way, also a person who's engaged with the community. That was a very important part of the description of that role. Someone who will be able to uh, work with the community, share the story, hear their story, a two-way conversation about what our community needs and wants, and how the police are serving those needs. We're hopeful to get a recruitment coordinator. That recruitment coordinator is someone who will augment the work that is already being done by Megan O'Leary. She is our current recruiting officer. That's a police officer. You need a police officer in a recruiting position. Um, and that is because uh, people ask, when people want to be cops, they want to talk to a cop and ask questions of cops. But we also need somebody who's going to understand better how the current market works. What 
uh, best practice tools are out there with regard to recruitment and how we tell that story uh, in a way that not only uh, communicates it, as does the, the public information officer, community engagement coordinator, but also tells the story in order to recruit and drive people to this agency. And then, uh, sure. sorry, so I want to make go a ahead. quick point on that just to make it's clear that those are two permanent positions that have been added to the structural budget of the BPD that is not, uh, that is separate from the 1.2 million three year. Uh, rebuilding plan, but these are resources that should definitely help with that rebuilding. Yes, sir. And, and then thank you very much for that clarification. Um, and then the, that money is going to be used by those individuals uh, in order to determine how we can market the Burlington Police Department. Um, and this is, frankly, a, a, a first stage of that. I, I'm hopeful that this message that all of you are carrying will resonate uh, through Chittenden County and beyond and begin to let people know that we are open for business and we are looking to rebuild, and we are looking to regrow, and we're looking to do it in a way that meets what our community has said that it wants and reestablish the kinds of, of, of safety that we expect here in Burlington. Do you want to touch, Chief, on any of the specific contract provisions you think are worth highlighting? Well, I, I, think, I think a lot of these are great. I think we have a, we have a really uh, a good place to work. This is a great place to work. Unlike a lot of places, we do allow beards. That was actually a decision of our police commission, working together with the police commission. They voted for that. I wasn't in favor of it, frankly. But the police commission voted for that and added that to our directives. We do allow beards. Uh, we do allow tattoos. These are things that are, 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 are part of uh, our younger generations haven't always been a part of policing, are not a part of many other agencies. They won't allow those kinds of things. A big one for us, very important for us, is that we will hire people who are not citizens of the United States so long as they are uh, permanent residents, green car holders. Uh, that is a big difference between a lot of other agencies, very big. And it's very important for us and this unique community where we, uh, more than almost any other part of the state, have a very large population of folks who fit that bill. And we want those folks to become part of this agency, whether as police officers or whether uh, entry level at, uh, at, as community service officers in order to build the skills necessary to become police officers. Being a cop is hard. It's a very difficult job. It is a job of shift work. You are going to miss holidays. You are going not always to be able to have the time off that you expected. Right now, we're working too much overtime, but that's always a function of the job. It is a job that exposes you to terrible things sometimes, but amazing things as well, and you get amazing opportunities to contribute. And the fact of the matter is not everybody makes it through. And the reason that projection that was on the previous slide is so bumpy is that we lose people. We lose people to planned attrition. In other words, they're people who are going to hit 20 years and be eligible for a pension and leave. And we lose people for other reasons. We lose people to injury. We lose recruits from the academy because it doesn't turn out to be what they thought that it was and uh, they will drop out. The three recruits we have, will all of them make it through? I hope so. We will do everything we can to support them here at this agency to make it so. But the fact of the matter is this is a tough profession and we don't want it to be anything but because we want to have high standards in whom we attract and whom we keep and we want them to want this job. That said, uh, we also want to ensure that we are opening this job to many different kinds of people, perhaps that haven't been interested in it before. That's an ongoing conversation that I'm part of at the state level as a member of a committee that works with the Criminal Justice uh, Council in order to assess entrance standards for the Vermont Police Academy. There are ongoing conversations about how the Vermont Police Academy works as well. I'm hopeful that we can tackle those in the coming years as well. But in the meantime, here at home in Burlington, we're going to use that money that we talked about for marketing. We're going to use it for uh, things that we have not done in the past with regard to uh, effective storytelling and effective brand sharing uh, to make certain that, that people understand what our brand is. And our brand is its compassion, it is uh, a service of victims, and it is public safety. With and for our neighbors. Thank you, Chief. Um, I think at this point we'd be happy to, to answer any questions that you folks have. Yeah, I, I don't. Sure. Uh, how does the uh, how does Burlington's starting salary compare? I think it blows everybody else out of the water right now in Vermont and in Chittenden County. Uh, and I think that it is a, a, a very fair, uh, a very strong starting salary, and it's indicative of the value we place on the people who want to come and do this work for our community. 
think we could probably follow up, Courtney, and share the state police scale if, um, sure. if you could see for comparison. Yeah, okay. Dan, can you work on that with, okay. okay. Go ahead. Uh, do you have Yeah, we do. Okay, the, the question is, um, uh, is part of this plan uh, to in some way address the housing challenges that officers um, face uh, when they're moving to the area and, and, and specifically if trying to move to Burlington? This is um, uh, something that, um, you know, we know very few of our current officers, uh, I don't know if you have an updated stat on that, but um, currently live in Burlington. It's something we would like to address directly. You want to speak to this effort? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so I don't have an exact stat on how many officers live in Burlington. It's not a huge number. I do. Uh, we have a number of officers who do, but it's not as large as we'd like it to be. More importantly, we would love new officers to be able to live here. I have been in discussions with uh, people at the, with the, the chair of the Queen City Police Foundation. That's a 501c3. It's a difficult proposition to try to determine whether or not uh, an entity like that is capable of, of working on housing issues. So we're still in the progress of discussing that. But the trick would be to find uh, people in Burlington who are, are willing to say, uh, particularly large you know, uh, people who have, have access to, to rental housing, uh, who will say, we will incentivize uh, Burlington officers living here. Um, and that's something that happens federally across the country. There are a number of programs that have existed at various times. Uh, to incentivize people to live, usually in neighborhoods that are are a, a little bit challenged is often a way to bring a cop into a neighborhood that maybe is, is on the cusp of sort of a turnover. Um, that's not necessarily something that we're looking for here. We want them to live in Burlington proper and uh, anywhere we can find would be great. And we want to work with uh, people who can uh, in, provide those incentives in ways that are lawful and fair, but are also encouraging to officers to come. Because it is a challenge. One of the officers who's a recruit right now had to figure out uh, where that he was going to stay during the pre-basic period that occurs here in Burlington before going down to the police academy in Pittsburgh. Um, after the police academy, he'll find a place. But to have to get that, you know, uh, several months early, as it were, was a, is a bit of a challenge. It's not something we've supported in the past in a sense of, of us having a mechanism for supporting it. That mechanism is, is something that we're going to build and use these funds to do that. Specifically, the the 150,000 that's shown is um, coming from the Queen City Foundation. Um, now that this is improved and in, in motion, we are going to nail down. Um, housing incentives have been envisioned as being a significant part of that. Um, I, I do think this is something uh, we can raise uh, raise funds for, and and that there's community support for, and that can be an additional incentive um, beyond the beyond the contract terms for. Um, for for recruits. If I may be clear, so it's not all from the Queen City Police Foundation. Uh, it, it would be a obvious do a money that we hope to be able to achieve through uh, fundraising or through grants. Some of it would be uh, through the police, the Queen City Police Foundation, not all of it. Some of it would be, uh, some of the things that we talked about during the budget presentation involved child care incentives. And those are things that other parts of the city are working on too. The mayor's made it clear that he's very supportive of that, working with uh, members of the marketplace in order to try to create that for other city employees as well. Um, many of these things hopefully will have that kind of extra benefit, that these aren't just for police officers, these are things that we can use to, to increase our, our overall city employment and in general attract people to this community. I have been working with other law enforcement agencies in the county to put together a, a sense of, of marketing that we all can share. Uh, other police departments in the county uh, through uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce and in order to say this is an attractive place to come and live because once we get them here in the county then we can we can scramble with South Burlington PD over it and determine whether or not this salary is better or not um, we can figure out all those other incentives but we want to get them here and and grow as a county as well not just as a city although I work for Burlington and I live in Burlington and I certainly prioritize Burlington getting that experience and growth. Sure. So we want we want 
Okay, uh, so the, the question was about quotas around both race and gender and around diversity hiring uh, beyond just uh, traditional or, or excuse me, uh, in, in a sense of gender and uh, non-binary employees. Um, we have had non-binary employees before. We've had transgender employees before, not as police officers. We've had, uh, we, we've certainly had a lot of uh, different sexual orientations as police officers. Um, those are, uh, we're looking for great candidates, period. We want people who, who come to us with skill sets that allow them to be what we want. We want, uh, we want people who can maintain order, who can be de-escalatory, who can connect with the community they serve, who can do that compassionately and fairly, and identity is a part of that. And what you bring from your past to the job going forward is a part of that. Do we have quotas? No. Quotas aren't lawful. We do have goals. We have goals. We've joined a, a movement called 30 by 30, which is run uh, out of New York, and it is 30 percent female representation in the police profession by 2030. We joined that before I was allowed to hire again. During the period of time where we were not allowed to pol uh, hire police officers, I joined that because I believe it to be important. My wife and I named our daughter Katie Elizabeth after Elizabeth Katie Stanton because we, I, I very much believe in, uh, in gender equality and making certain that we have uh, fair representations on that in a profession that hasn't always been great at it. Um, we are also, of course, looking to find people who, are, uh, who bring with them uh, advanced degrees or unique kinds of degrees, not just criminal justice, not just people with military backgrounds, but all of those things are important to us too. Because all of these things can create a, a department that is able to represent a whole range of different service needs as it, it addresses the, you know, the requirements of a, of a community like ours. Uh, yes. So, uh, no, in, in, in seriousness, and to repeat the question for you since you need that, um, do we expect there to be a certain amount of competition, and do we expect there to be uh, a sense of interest from other places? Yeah. We have lost some officers to neighboring towns over the past two years. I'm hopeful some of those may come back. I'm hopeful that we may uh, attract others to us. And the incentivization, the pay scale is a component of that. The $15,000 hiring bonus that was approved by the city council in autumn of last year is a component of that. Um, we need that kind of support from our community, both our elected representatives, the community at large, to make certain that people want to come work here, because it's not merely about the money. Uh, this is good money. It's very good money for this profession. But this is a hard profession. And the fact of the matter is nobody does it only for the money. And I don't know that I'd want people who did. We want people who do this work because it's meaningful to them, because they understand how meaningful it is to the community they serve, and because it is a calling. Cops count and police matter. And that means that cops on an individual basis, they, they count. Everything they do on a daily basis counts. The police matter as an entity. That is what that, uh, you know, is, a, is a significant part of any community. And I think that we are in a place right now in Burlington uh, that we recognize that, and we're prepared to, to bring people aboard with that understanding. I don't know if you want to say something, sir. Um, I think we just, I'm not sure we touched on it. Um, there might have been a slide on it that I don't think we paused on, but the, this idea of, of uh, getting to this target over three years basically would involve doubling the amount of recruits, of new recruits going through the academy over what we've had historically. It would include, um, essentially, is it, is it doubling or more with the laterals? Yes, sir. So thank you, sir. Uh, so it is a, it's a 50% increase in the number of recruits that we hire in each Sorry, class. 50%. It is a 50% increase in the number of laterals that we bring aboard in each calendar year. And it is a 100% increase in the retention. That is uh, from a, a, a relatively low retention of, I think, 30-something percent to about 50% retention. So that accounts for the fact that we don't keep everybody. And retention is not just the groups that we bring in. It's also the people who are already here. We lose people, again, as I said before, we lose people to retirement. We lose people to resignation. We lose people to realizing that this profession isn't to that for them. Occasionally, we lose people to termination. But we uh, are not going to keep everybody we bring in. That's not the nature of this uh, profession, or any profession for that matter. We need to improve, however, how many we do keep. If we can do that, if we can double the, uh, that improvement, uh, if we can bring in laterals at 50% higher numbers than we have in the past, if we can bring in recruit classes, uh, you know, we have three. I need six. 
I need six in the class in January, and I need six in the class uh, next August. If we can do that, then we keep to that schedule. That is ambitious, but achievable. Anything can derail that. And if we end up with a class where there's four people instead of six people, then that number changes a little bit. If I end up with a, a, a spate of, of resignations or retirements, that could change that a little bit. But that prognostication there, which is entirely a prognostication, it is a hypothetical look at here's our patterns of retention and recruitment over the past, here are the goals that we're setting for ourselves, here are the knowns, people who I know when certain people are gonna hit their 20 and are likely to retire. I don't know when other people are gonna say this is enough for me or I've changed my feelings about this place or uh, it's just time to hang it up or, or something happened in my life and I can't be here anymore. I don't know when recruits aren't gonna make it through because they get injured or because they fail out because our standards are high and so are the Vermont Police Academies or because they realize this just is not what I thought it was going to be. I can't prognosticate for that on an individual basis, but I can estimate when those things happen based on how often they've happened before, and I can say, I want to overachieve, I want to achieve above that. And that's what we see there. Is it something that we're absolutely going to do? It is ambitious but achievable. But there are a lot of things that can get in the way of making that happen. And honestly, the more all of us work together and pull together as a community too, then the more likely it is that that will happen. Hey Sandy, go ahead. Um. Uh, good morning to both of you. My name is Sandy Bear, and I'm an attorney, and I'm an attorney who's uh, particularly uh, involved in incidents of domestic violence. And I'm wondering if, if, number one, did domestic violence situations increase with the uh, attrition of police officers? And what, if that's the case, are you going to include in your recruitment um, police officers and others who are experts at dealing with domestic violence situations. Yeah, I was, thank you. Great, great question. Uh, so, right here, domestic violence prevention is one of the specialized positions that we offer. We offer specialty assignments like detectives, narcotics, canine officers, domestic violence prevention. We have an airport, an international airport where we send officers. That is a different thing than almost any other police department in the state. Um, domestic violence is right up there because that is incredibly important to us. Your question around the numbers. We did not see an increase in domestic violence assault, misdemeanor or felony. In fact, those have gone down a little bit during the pandemic. What we have seen a tremendous increase is domestic disturbance, which is a precursor category. And sometimes what we get to a situation, we're not able to ascertain whether or not there was an assault whether it was a misdemeanor assault or a felony assault or an assault at all. But we know that there was something that caused neighbors to call or others to call that caused us to take note of it. And that rose drastically. Um, I'm hopeful that what that means actually is that we're intervening at earlier stages and that the decrease in, in assaults is, is a good thing because we're doing a little better at those interventions before uh, a domestic disturbance becomes a domestic assault. Um, I know that we are working hard. I have kept our domestic violence prevention officer. I've had to reassign a lot of specialty roles as we have gotten smaller. We went from an, uh, an entity with, with 90, you know, normally around 96, we had 92. Uh, in June of 2020, we are down right now to 61, uh, and uh, fewer than that are available for, uh, for, for actual deployments, 54. And of those, only 21 are actually on patrol, who are, are dedicated as officers to patrol. I have nevertheless, despite we, as we get smaller and smaller, I have kept that domestic violence prevention officer assigned to her role because the role is so important. And uh, frankly, she makes officers on the roads jobs easier because they can refer cases to her and she can take them over in a way that it ultimately makes it easier on the road even though they are missing a person that they could otherwise have as a co-worker on patrol. It is an incredibly important role. Is it one that, that we will continue to have? As long as we can keep it, I will keep that. Uh, and right now, as I said, I'm hopeful that we are not going to get smaller. Uh, but one can never say never, uh, particularly after where we've been over the past two years. So I, I want to know that we, but I, this is a very important piece to me. And it's a piece that I hope is indicative of, of our agency's, uh, the, the vastness of, of our opportunity in this agency, which is only going to increase as we grow. We used to have officers who did emergency response, an emergency response officer. We used to have a community affairs officer. I see the need to embed an officer in what we call CAPE our Crisis Assessment Intervention Program, which is where our CSLs reside, which is where the Domestic Violence Prevention Officer resides, where our Victims Advocate resides. Uh, I see the, office, the need to, to have co-deployment of officers at some point. It's not something we can do right now. I want us to be able to engage with the community better, both as a community affairs officer, but other positions as well. 
And right now, we're being asked for that by members of, for example, our police commission, other members of the public. And yet, when we have 21 people, on any given shift, we may only have two police officers patrolling the city. To have them pull away and engage with the public at a barbecue or going to a school event is not feasible. We need to grow back to be able to do those things that are so important to having strong relationships with the community. Those, maybe the CSLs and those and sure. So when you when you say the civilian positions, do you mean the the public information officer and the recruitment coordinator? Okay, because because obviously we have the CSOs already. We we need to grow them. Um, we have the CSLs already, and we need to grow those. Uh, we're doubling essentially each of those roles, and that's going to be a priority for us. Uh, the PIO position is is nearly ready to post. I think that it will be posted this week. The recruitment coordinator will take a little bit longer and ultimately we'll have to go through a process uh, at Board of Finance and other places in order to make certain that it, it's approved. But I'm hopeful that we get both of those positions posted uh, ASAP and then are able to start doing working with, with human resources, using our channels for advertising these kinds of positions in order to, to reach out to communities, both law enforcement communities, people who have experience as a, as a law enforcement PIO, or that don't. That are, that are coming from a different kind of place. And ultimately, that hiring process will be what HR does with regard to the, the identification, and then we will have to do background checks and vetting, and there will have to be some kind of, of interview process that will uh, in, inevitably involve the mayor's office and others, um, and we'll figure out, you know, because this is going to be an important position. It's going to work a lot with the mayor's office. It's going to work a lot with you all. Um, maybe I'll have one of you guys sit on the on the hiring panel. I don't know, but uh, it's it's going to be a process that we that we follow. Um, we're I hope to be able to post that this week. That I can't answer because they back two months from the time something's posted, two to three months from posting to to in general. I mean, maybe there's specific things here. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but, sir. But that's typically what we see. The uh, we have I want to be clear. Our the background check may be a little bit may take things a little longer than that. But okay. I'm I'm I'm. <laughs> if he tells me three months, we're going to try to make that happen in three months. Excellent. The um, and I want to be clear. Both the positions were in the budget, as I said earlier. They were funded, and. Um, the PIO position is fully ready for posting. The, uh, community, the, the recruitment, recruitment coordinator requires an additional step, as the chief referenced, so that, that, that it's a little bit behind that, but that should be happening soon. Yes, sir. <clears throat> What's the benefit of having a civilian PIO as opposed to a uniformed officer PIO? You know, I'll just I'll let the chief answer in a sec, too. The, the, sorry, the, 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 the question is, why, why have we created this uh, civilian recruitment position um, when this is something we've had um, uh, uh, an officer do in the past? Um, again, Officer O'Neill here with us, who's serving that role now. Um, and we, are, we will continue to have officers very involved in, the, in this. Um, however, this is something the state police have recently created a position, very similar position. It's uh, at a time when we have such limited sworn officer resources, this um, I, I think is really necessary. Two, two things going on right now. We have more limited sworn officer resources than we ever had, and we have a greater need to uh, recruit than we've ever had. So putting additional resources in place to help succeed right now, uh, this is, I think, a logical way to do it. Again, it's, it's one that other agencies we're seeing do, do and um, I think it especially in this period will allow, uh, hopefully will allow our officers, our limited number of officers to be deployed um, uh, to, to the public safety needs uh, as much as possible as opposed to pulling them off for sort of essentially administrative uh, or, you know, uh, some will be strategic efforts, but they're ones that you don't need a, you know, you know, you don't need to have gone through the officer certification program to be able to do this work. And, and the same is true of the PIO position as well. Uh, so uh, the reason, you know, a lot of agencies work with non-uniformed uh, PIOs, uh, with, with non-sworn PSOs, um, uh, PIOs, excuse me, uh, is, is, this, is the same thing. Uh, um, and a lot of places end up bringing, you know, former newspaper people in or former media people. So if any of you guys are looking, uh, we'll be posting that soon. And, and we'd be happy to have your application in. Is there going to be any focus or targeting towards, um, you know, the prevalence of
gun to violence I've experienced too within my neighborhood um, in the past couple months. So, um, is there any uh, plan to address that? So yes, I think the last uh, press conference we had was um, following the recent um, homicide and suicide uh, several weeks ago. Um, Chief Mirad, uh, I mentioned in my opening remarks, we're extremely focused right now on uh, the rise in, in, in gunfire incidents. It's extremely concerning to us. Um, we have had two events here standing with the state's attorney, uh, making it clear that this, um, this type of uh, activity, which is unusual in Burlington. We haven't seen this kind of shootings at anywhere near these levels in, in recent years, that it's got to stop, that it's unacceptable. Um, and we are working very hard and have been working hard throughout this period to hold individuals accountable who are, 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 are firing these guns. And um, I think there has been 19, 18, 19 arrests uh, of these 40 different gunfire incidents going back to the beginning of 2020. Um, there are some significant cases that are still open that we're working very hard on currently. I will say we are also uh, in a way that um, is unprecedented in the, the 10 years uh, that I've been in this role, uh, having conversations with other agencies seeking to bring additional law enforcement resources uh, to bear, whether that's in terms of investigatory resources, uh, sharing of information with other agencies, uh, prosecutorial resources. There is a great deal of work going on right now to, uh, you know, especially as we've been talking, given the limited resources Burlington, the BPD has currently to bring other resources to bear here. And um, we will be talking more about that in the days and weeks to come. Um, and that is, very, that is very much a part of the ongoing work. Whether it, it ex and, and, and I think that is the, sort of the backdrop um, uh, of what we're talking about today, that we, to, to have a fully uh, resourced detective bureau to be able to, to properly um, uh, do everything we can to uh, disincentivize, to uh, make it less likely that these crimes take place in the first place. We need a more robust police department, and so a big part of the reason we are pushing so hard, taking all these steps to rebuild the department is, uh, and well, I, I, I want to be very clear, we have the reason I feel such urgency in um, creating these plans and delivering on these plans is uh, because of, of that and some of the other concerning public safety trends we face. I, um, so I, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure if you were maybe you were asking something slightly different about whether did, did that address your question or you or or is there something more specific you were looking for in that question? I guess I was looking for like structurally like how you're probably going to plan, but I understand that it's a very recent event, so you're probably still in that process. Well, I'll say that if, if we were at 85 today, I would probably have an officer devoted to uh, a, a task force position about this. Uh, I can't afford to do that right now. Our detectives, we don't have enough of them. So um, instead, we have officers devoted to the cases in front of them. Uh, and those include, as the mayor said, a, a lot of cases that we are working on. Um, you know, I, we said it before at a, a previous press conference, but when you have that increase in volume, and, and let's be clear, that 500% is, is a shocking number. It's a small, it's a, that's a shocking percentage number. It is a small absolute number, right? We are talking about a small absolute number, and yet it's huge relative to previous years. And officers, detectives who have previously had one or two of these incidents a year, uh, to which they, they, invest, they investigate, are now having one every other week. And every single detective in that uh, detective unit basically has a shooting assigned to him or her in order to look at them. It is a, it's a tremendous burden on them. Uh, if I had more, then I would be able to pull one out and say, you are specialized and you are doing this. This is your job to, to, to uh, tackle all this. I, I don't have those kinds of resources because they still have all those burglaries that are up. Many of those car thefts that are up end up having a certain amount of detective work applied to them. Um, many other kinds, you know, certain felony assaults may have detective work applied to them. And so uh, they are, they're, they're pushing more than their normal load up the hill. Um, but the more folks we get, the, the bigger we grow, uh, the more able we are to actually sort of get to, to some of that and, and figure out new ways to tackle them. Um, but as the mayor said, we are doing that already, particularly with regard to partners in the, uh, in the county and at the federal level. Um, and I actually, you know, we have had some movement on some of our shooting cases. 
that I'm, I'm hopeful that we will be able to talk about some of that movement soon. But a component of, of any kind of investigation is, is also making certain that the people you're looking into uh, don't have uh, you know, enough information for you to be able to look at them. So that's a component of it too. Suicide. Has there been any change on the motive that you've been able to find out or the victim's condition? Uh, no, no. The, the the victim is is alive and still at the hospital. Um, the 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 picture of, of motive hasn't changed much. We uh, obviously have the suspect um, who took his own life uh, and uh, was was there, knew both of those victims. Um, and it does appear to have a component of there was a, a relationship, a, a, an amorous relationship. Um, and so to that extent, it has domestic violence components. Uh, but um, we are, that's a case that is still being worked on. I don't believe we have yet been able to interview that victim. I think that victim is, uh, is still, uh, you know, it's a delicate situation. This is somebody who has been through a lot and uh, the ability to, to, to do the things we need to do to understand fully what occurred uh, are, uh, we have to be cognizant of that, we have to be compassionate and caring about that, and those take a back seat to worrying about a timetable for us. You, want, you can have the final question uh, if you have one more. Um, from Rock Point this weekend, um, were you able to identify a victim or circumstances or will anything at that site be changed? Uh, so uh, I can't speak to, to the question about the site. Um, what I can say is, uh, you know, I hike in Rock Point uh, pretty regularly, take my, my kids and the dog there. Um, I think that it is a safe place that has a certain amount of, uh, you know, you've got to be careful when you're there. We believe currently that this was probably a suicide. Um, I'm not prepared yet to name the individual. I'm confirming that we've made next of kin notifications first. But based on the history the individual had, uh, this was a person that law enforcement had had 20 interactions, excuse me, 14 interactions with since June 1st. Uh, and, and that's a, a lot. And many of them were driven by uh, issues around mental health, et cetera. Um, I'm pretty certain that this was a suicide. Um, we worked with the Coast Guard in order to gain access to uh, the decedent. There was no ground access. Uh, our officer actually had to take off his gun belt and, and vest and jump in the lake in his uniform in order to get to the shore. Um, this was, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a very sad incident, uh, a, a very terrible incident, but I don't believe that it has any implications for anything wider in the community. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Chief. Um, appreciate you all joining us and talk more soon.